we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I, I forgot to charge my little mic, so I'm going to try and use these. I usually don't like to use these microphones because they're a little, I, I think they're a little echoey, but I, I think for long, uh, for, for you know, one time, I think it's going to be fine. Um, now, I've got, uh, oh, wrong thing. Um, I've got something I wanted to hand out to you all to show you all real quick. Um, I'll go ahead and get the signing sheet started as well. Um, if you recall, uh, last time we looked at uh, uh, axially loaded members, and then one of the things we did is we started to tackle problems where, okay, what happens if the uh, uh, the load varies, or what happens if the area varies? Um, now, the one that we did with the area, we sort of, I guess we took a shortcut. I guess that'd be a, a fair way of putting it. So there's three, and I'm just gonna give the rest to you all. Um, the one that we did with the uh, uh, with the area, we took a little bit of a shortcut, and I wanted to at least do my diligence and talk about that. So um, what we did in class is we said, all right, let's assume that the area varies linearly, which technically isn't 100% correct, and we'll see why here in a second. If the area varies linearly, then the area is basically a line. So, we determined what the slope of that line was, we determined what the y-intercept was, and then we went and integrated. And we got an answer that was something about like this, right? This one up here. Now, this, uh, what I have down here is, is the reason why I didn't uh, go into this is because I just didn't want um, last time to be a calculus lesson, lesson all over again. But I just wanted to show you so that you were aware. If we did it a little more accurately and assume that it's not the area that varies linearly, it's the diameter, so if we say the diameter is you know, a linear variation, well then the area is pi over 4 times that squared. And then now we've got this integral where it's you know, dividing by a polynomial and all that. And you can go through and use whatever to do that integral substitution or what have you. I just wanted to keep it pretty straightforward. All right. So far so good? I just wanted you to provide you with that. I'm going to do my best to try and, how can I put this? There's going to be calculus in the class, but I'm going to do my best to try and minimize it a little bit, um, or at least make it um, as useful as possible, but not you know, try and make this class be Calc 2 all over again. Okay, any questions? All right, okay. Um, I've got the sign-in sheet passed around. Um, you all have a homework assignment that you turned in to me on fundamentals. I'm going to get that to the TA and try and get that back to you uh, as soon as I can. Um, a uh, couple things in, in terms of you know, bookkeeping and whatnot. I haven't gotten around to doing it for this class, but I've decided to go ahead and post all of the lecture notes, all the handouts on Blackboard. So um, I haven't done it in here yet. I did it in structural analysis, but I haven't done it in here. But if you go on to Blackboard, maybe within the next day or so, you're going to see a folder that says lecture notes, and all these PDFs that I've been, are giving you all, they're all going to be there, So just, just so you have them. Um, and I'm going to do that with everything. The one thing I, I don't think I'm going to post are the solutions. Um, I'm going to just hand out hard copies for those. But um, I'm going to give that to the TA. And I'm going to try and get it graded and back to you all as soon as I can. That's going to be my general policy. Uh, in terms of an exam, your first exam is essentially going to cover homeworks one, two, and three. And one way or another, you all are going to have either those assignments back or the solutions back before the exam. I'm going to make sure you're as prepared as possible. So, sound good? Okay. But yeah, I'll try and get that back to you as soon as I can. You're probably going to get another homework assignment, I'm thinking Thursday, because we're probably going to finish, what, maybe Thursday, maybe Tuesday, we're probably going to finish axially loaded members sometime uh, soon. Okay? So, everybody okay on bookkeeping and timeline? I just wanted to make sure you all are well aware of what's coming up. Everybody good? All right, so let, let's get back into the notes and get back into what it is we were talking about, just so everybody's clear, so I'm going to go back a little bit. <coughs> okay, so our first portion of the class, this whole module, is all about defining two fundamental concepts, stress and strain, and then recognizing that they're related for different materials. And then we started taking those applications and let's, or those, those concepts, and let's apply them towards typical engineering problems. The first one being uh, a member that's subjected to axial load. So, you know, if stress and strain are linearly proportional, uh, assuming they are, 
uh, assuming that we're trying to keep those stresses in the linear range, which is what we try and do in, in, our, uh, in, in most of our designs. If we can keep our designs linear uh, and economical, we definitely want to do it. <laughs> so we can go through and use stress and strain definitions to define a relationship between applied load and resulting deformation. That's basically our, our, the long and short of what it is we've been looking at for the past little bit. So, what, so far, what's made it complicated is that we can have variable problems. In other words, we can have instances where the load varies and instances where the area varies. I mean, if we want to get mathematical, technically we could have E varying as well, but that's pretty unlikely in a real world scenario. I mean, if you've got some bar, it's, you know, in a loading scenario like this, it's typically going to be made of a single material throughout. Now, we can take bar A and attach it to bar B, and they can have different materials, but we wouldn't use calculus for that. We would just add up the amount of stretch for one bar and the amount of stretch for another. And we looked at two problems, one where the, uh, a very simple one where the load varies and a pretty basic one where the area varies. And that's sort of where we left off. All right. Uh, anybody got any questions? Okay. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a different type of problem. We're going to attack this for axial loads and for torsion. We're going to look at this in a, in a number of different instances. i got a couple folks in here who are in structural analysis, so they've heard a little bit of this before in there. But um, I'm not going to get too deep into defining whether or not um, a structure is determinate or not in here, but you at least need to be aware of the concept. So what, what I want to do to explain this concept of static determinacy is I want to look at this truss up here. So I've got here uh, a two-bar truss, you know, it's pinned on both, uh, on, on the top, or on the bottom of both bars, and i got some load applied to it. Now, I can tell you that just by observation, this truss is statically determinate. And what I mean by that is this, okay? You all have done truss analyses before, so you've heard that whole method of joints and method of sections before, right? I mean, that should at least be familiar. I'm not expecting you to be experts in the topic, but you should at least remember it, right? Okay, well, if I do a method of joints analysis and I look at this joint up here, I've got two unknown forces. I've got the force in this member to the left, I've got the force in this member to the right. Two unknown forces. Now, when you're doing a method of joints analysis, you only have two equations of equilibrium. Some forces in the x direction, some forces in the y direction. The reason for that is all the forces are all meeting towards a common point, so there's no moments. Okay? So, this structure would be one that is statically determinate. Okay? The reason why is that I've got just as many equations as I do unknowns. And if those match up, that's a structure that's statically determined. Okay? This is not statically determined. If I throw another bar in there, now this is indeterminate. Okay? Because I've got more unknowns than I do equations of equilibrium. Okay? And that's where things get tough. Okay? Um, I say tough, you know, it really uh, isn't. Um, we're just going to go about things uh, a little differently. Um, does everybody recognize that this structure would, would be one that is indeterminate? Because I've got too many unknowns. I've got three bars that I need to figure out, and I still only have two equations of, of equilibrium, that is. Everybody okay with that? <coughs> All right. In order to solve for the forces in this, uh, or, or in this truss, we have to use compatibility relationships. Okay? Now, what I mean by compatibility relationships um, is all about the way the structure deforms. Hence why we're talking about it in this course, mechanics of deformable bodies. Okay? The idea is this. I've got this structure. I take a load and I apply it. This truss joint's going to move, right? I mean, if I take a structure and I push on it, it's going to deform, right? It's going to move somewhere, I don't know, about maybe like right here. So this bar might stretch a little bit. This bar might shrink a little bit. This bar might... I don't know, stretch or shrink, I'm not sure. But, but the long and short of it is, before and after, I need to determine that displacement so that all those uh, displacements in those members are compatible, that they all go along with the same pattern. Does that make sense? It's going to make sense here in a little bit when we look at the different types of indeterminate problems that we do. Okay? We typically deal with two types 
of indeterminate problems, not just in this course, but I mean, it, there's really only two types of indeterminate problems that we deal with as engineers, okay? Now, there are structures that exhibit external indeterminacy, like this trust that we just looked at, you know, too many members or too many support conditions. There are also instances of internal indeterminacy, and internal indeterminacy is going to be like this example we're getting ready to do, a composite member a single axial member that's made of two materials, which is very common in engineering applications. I go, like I said, I, I'm a civil engineer, so I use a lot of civil engineering applications. There are plenty uh, of instances where we'll have, you know, a column in a building like this that's a steel eye shape, but to increase its capacity, we can case it in concrete. So we've got a composite column, a member that is, uh, consists of both steel and concrete. So. You know, that's a, a possibility as well. <laughs> Alright, so in those instances we're going to have, you know, more than one, un or more unknowns than we have equations of equilibrium. So we're going to use these whole compatibility relationships, and, and compatibility relationships are all going to relate to the structure's deformation, to its displacements. In other words, that when it's all said and done, the displacements of those coincident points all have to coincide. They all have to go together. Okay? And if that's a little vague, if that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, it will when we look at this problem. Okay? So I want to take a little bit and make sure we're all understanding what's going on with this problem, and then we're going to attack it one by one. One thing that makes you feel better, no calculus in this problem. No calculus. Okay? Now why is there no calculus? Okay? There's no calculus for two reasons. We don't have an instance where the load varies. I mean, I'm taking this column and I'm going like this. Regardless of where I cut a section, I'm going to have the same force that's applied, this 9,000 pounds. So the force is constant. Now you could argue that, well, the, the longer the column is, you know, it's going to be heavier due to its own self-weight, but it it's only one and a half foot long. I'm just going to neglect the whole self-weight aspects. <laughs> so the load is constant. And also the area is constant. I mean, take a look at the column. Regardless of where you slice it, I'm going to have the same area. Okay? So no calculus. Okay? And that's an important point to, to recognize. Even though it's a composite column and even though it's indeterminate, constant load, constant area, no integration. Sound good? Okay. Now, let's take a look and make sure we understand what's going on. So we've got a column that's uh, one and a half foot long, it's subjected to a load of 9,000 pounds. Now, the whole um, column is four inches in diameter, and what I've got is I've got a two inch brass core that's surrounded by aluminum. Okay? So I, the, why, when I say composite, I mean there's two materials. Okay? Right, I've got uh, brass and aluminum. And I went through and I've provided the Young's modulus, remember the modulus of elasticity, that relationship between uh, stress and strain. Remember, we, we boiled that down and we said, well, if you take the area and the length, you know, the volume out of the, the, the problem by uh, converting everything to stress and strain, then we can get unique properties for different materials. This would be the E value for aluminum, the E value for brass. Okay, what I'm asking is let's determine the stress in each material. Okay, does that make sense? Everybody good? Okay. So let's play around with this. Let's see what we can come up with. All right. I think I need to open up exam problems. My help. Warm, they've got it set to 78 degrees. I don't know, that may have to leave. Okay. Now, before we get started, like I said, with just as this, with this problem as with others, I'm going to do my best to be consistent when it comes to units. I'm going to write all this out. And, it, and, and again, I think that's a good practice for when you're doing your homework, that you all ought to write all this out. Okay. Okay. So let's see what we can come up with.
right. So let's look at some given information. All right. So tell me some things that were given in the problem. What's some info you know right off the bat? Temperature load is 1,000 pounds. Okay, so the load is 9,000 pounds. Okay, right off the bat, the force is given in pounds. So maybe we ought to just keep it that way. Keep all the forces in pounds. All right, what else is given? The diameters. Okay, so the diameter of, let's see, the outside was 4 inches and the diameter of the inside was 2 inches, right? Okay, so pounds and inches, maybe we ought to keep that consistent. What else? Length, Length is 1.5 feet. So maybe we ought to convert that to inches, which would be 18. All right, I'm going through this exercise just to ensure everything's you know consistent. I can't tell you how many times that there, there are students who, who've done problems and they've all they, all the concepts are right and all the values are right. They're just in the wrong units. Okay, so just trying to be diligent. All right, and what else were we given? We were given the E values for the brass and the E values for the aluminum. Now for brass it was 15 and this was 10. Okay. So far so good? Okay. Now let's make sure we're clear on what's going on with the, uh, the, the, the column. So forgive my artwork, I'm going to do the best I can. So here's the column. All right, and then we've got this core inside, right? Now this core inside is two inches. This is four inches. Okay, now the core, which one, is the core the aluminum or the brass? The core is the brass, so this is brass. Maybe I'll sort of shade that in. Or this is brass, and this is aluminum. Something like that. Okay. All right. I've got this drawn out. If I've got the diameters, what can I compute? What quantity do you think is going to be important for each of these segments? The area. The area. Okay. So let's start off with a simple one. Let's start off with the brass. What's the area of the brass, the cross-sectional area of that brass component? There we go. Pi over 4 uh, di squared. Right? The inner diameter squared. So that is pi over 4, 2 inches squared, which that's just pi, so 3.5. 142 inches squared. So far, so good? Now, what's the area of the aluminum? Okay. Minus the brass, right? Minus the DI. There you go. It's not pi over 4 times 4 squared, it's 4 squared minus 2 squared because we've got to take it out. We're, I mean, Imagine we're calculating the area of that donut. So we've got to take out the, the donut hole in the middle. Okay? So the area of the aluminum is pi over 4 d naught squared minus d i squared. Okay? Does everybody understand why I'm doing that? Am I good? Okay. All right. So that's pi over 4. All right. So that's 16 minus 4, that's 12 divided by 4, that's 3 pi. So that's like 9.425. All right. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Now here's where the equilibrium and the compatibility 
just going to come into play. Okay? First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a section. Okay? So we'll say cut a section. And I'm going to call this the equilibrium. What do I mean by that? Okay, so here's the column. Well, let's see, I've got this load plate. I've got, and there's my column. And then maybe what I'll do is I'll sort of do something like this, something like that. And then I've got that. Okay, what do I mean by that? I'm taking this column, and that's what, 18 inches, so I'm looking at the column on the side, and I'm loading it like that, right? Okay, now, if I got P going down, the reaction here at the bottom is that P is going up, right? I mean, if I sit here and I press on this table with 50 pounds, it's pushing up with 50 pounds, right? Make sense? All right, now what I'm going to do is... Use my secret weapon of structural engineering, samurai sword or a lightsaber if you're a sci-fi fan, and I'm going to cut through the column. Okay? Now, if I look up or look down, it doesn't matter. I can look up or look down. Um, let's look up. Okay? So, I've got, so we'll say this. And I've got this load acting down. Okay. All right. Here's where things get complicated. All right. I've got this force, what is it, 9,000 pounds acting down, right? I've got to have some amount acting upward. But I propose to you, I've got two forces essentially acting upwards, and it's kind of difficult to draw, so I'm just going to draw them side by side. I've got some axial force P brass, and some force you know, P aluminum. All right. the, the column is reacting, but there's two separate forces. There's a force in the aluminum and a force in the brass. Does that make sense? My point is, is that if I go through and do equilibrium, and I say sum of forces in the y direction equals zero, what I'm saying is that whatever that 9,000 pounds has to be, which I know that, I know P is 9,000 pounds, that equals sum force in the brass plus uh, sum force ahead of myself, in the aluminum. That's a problem in terms of uh, equilibrium or in terms of solving this. If I did not consider mechanics of deformable bodies, this problem would be over because I can't solve it. Why? Because I've got two unknowns. One, two, and I only have one equation. I need more information. Okay? So let's go back to what this class is, mechanics of deformable bodies. I sit on this table, it deforms. It might deform a small amount, but I guarantee you it deforms. Okay? So, let's see if we can reason through this. I've got this column, and I've got this load plate. What's going to happen to it? It's going to squish, right? Now, what can you tell me about how much the aluminum uh, compresses versus how much the brass compresses? Is there anything you can tell me about those two deflections? They're going to be the same. Okay? There we go. So, Here's equation one. Okay? Here's equation one. All right? Does everybody have everything on this slide? Okay. So equilibrium got me equation one. Here's equation two, compatibility. All 
I propose to you that the deflection of the aluminum equals the deflection of the brass. That's your second equation. Two equations, two unknowns, now we can solve. Does that make sense? Okay. How do we go about this? All right. Let me ask you. We don't have any variation in load, right? The load's constant and the area is constant. So let's assume that this was a single material. How would you compute the deflection? How would you compute how much it compresses? If you don't have any varying load, don't have any varying area. PL over EA, right? So I propose to you that looking at equation two, let's look at equation two, right? That delta aluminum is P aluminum times the length of the aluminum, and you'll see what I'm going to do here in a second, over the area of the aluminum times the E of the aluminum. That's got equal E in the brass, the length of the brass, the area of the brass, the E of the brass. Anybody see something you can do to this equation to make it a little simpler before we go any further? Can we cross out the L's? We can cross out the L's. Why? They're the same. The length of the aluminum equals the length of the brass. So if I divide both sides by L, I can cancel that out right now. Simple, right? Okay, so that's equation two. Now let's go back to equation one. All right. Would you agree that if you look at equation one, would you agree that uh, it doesn't really matter which one we solve for, would you agree that Let's say P brass equals P minus P aluminum. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I just moved that over to the other side. See what I did? Just took that and moved it on over. Okay. Everybody all right with that? The reason why is I'm going to take this and I'm going to plug it into that. So if I say plug one into two, I'm going to get the following. one step at a time. Do we know the area of the aluminum? We calculated that earlier, didn't we? Do we know this? We calculated that too, right? We know that. We know that. We know the P. The P is 9,000 pounds, right? What, how many unknowns am I looking at right here? Just P aluminum, right? So I can rearrange and solve for P aluminum right now. So, now we engage in the wonderful world of alphabet soup. So, this is where we're starting to deal with a bunch of uh, variables running around. So, I don't like fractions, so I'm going to cross multiply. So, I'm going to say, you know, this times this equals that times that. So, what do we got? We got E aluminum, A brass. E brass. And if you want, you could just say E sub B instead of writing out the whole brass thing. If that you want to reduce your notes a little bit. Equals A aluminum. E aluminum or E sub A or whatever. Alright. See what I'm doing? Okay. Over here on the right. We got this term in parentheses, let's expand that out. So
I'll give y'all a second. Y'all have those right down. You can wait. I think I still see some folks writing. Y'all good? Right. I'm going to go on to the next panel. where we left off. Um, now, keep in mind what I'm trying to solve for in this, is this P aluminum, this one right here. So I'm going to take this and move that all over there because you get all my P aluminums on one side. Soup, I know. But all in all, is that pretty straightforward? It's not too bad, right? It's just doing equilibrium and recognizing that they're both going to stretch the same amount. So far, so good? Okay, all right. So now it's time to plug each other. I'm going to need y'all's help. So well, let, let's, let's get our numbers plugged in. Let's start on the bottom. What's the area of the grass? Um, e for the aluminum, that's the 10 times 10 to the 6. Now what's P? 9,000. You got six thousand. Who else? Is that number seconded? What's the P in the brass? 
3,000. So I can say, therefore, and I can say like back to equation one, I can say that the P in the brass is 3,000. Oh. Now, is that the answer to the problem, though? Just so we're clear. What's the problem asking for? The stress. Right, that's the load in each element. How do we get the stress in each element? Divided by the area. There we go. So, therefore, if we want to find the sigma in the aluminum, we just take P in the aluminum divided by the area of the aluminum. And the sigma in the brass, we take P in the brass and the A of the brass. Oh my goodness. <laughs> You all do that. Tell me which we get, or tell me what we get for each one of these. Six thirty-six point six. Six thirty-six point six. What? PSI. There we go. And the one on the bottom. Anybody second that? What did you say? Uh, for the aluminum, 636.6, yeah. and for the brass, 954.9. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? That's not too bad, is it? That is an indeterminate analysis problem. Okay. And for those of you who have any for structural analysis, later on, you know, towards the end of the semester, we're going to look at indeterminate structural analysis problems, and it's really no different. I mean, we might approach it a little differently, um, looking at, at, at different types of structures and different types of loads and things like that. But in the end, when we have more unknowns than we do equations of equilibrium, we're always going to go back to the way the structure deflects in order to determine its response. So, you know. Uh, if we have a, a beam that's got too many supports, we might look at one of those supports and recognize that the deflection at that support is zero. So we figure out what the deflection would be if that support wasn't there, and then ask, well, what load would bring it back to zero, and there's your reaction. So that's the long and short of it. Um, does anybody have any questions? This isn't too bad, is it? Isn't too bad? Okay. Given you anything at all. 
So now we have to go through and actually do this problem a little, I guess, more real, if that, if that makes any sense. Okay? Now, what, uh, let me ask you this. In addition to, uh, I guess, the pedigree information that you think you need to solve this problem, what other information did I give you for this problem? I've given you the dimensions, the uh, areas, the ease. What else did I give you? Something else there. Mm -hmm. Well, the lengths, yeah. I'm talking about the material properties. I gave you these sigma y's, the yield stress, right? Why is that important? Because we're going to determine the stresses in each rod. We're also going to take a look and see whether or not these rods have yielded or not. If they, if they are behaving acceptably, okay? This is going to be a sort of a design evaluation, if you will. You know, we're going to go through, compute the stress in the steel rod, compute the stress in the bronze rod, and then see, well, are they behaving acceptably? So that, that's what that uh, data is going to be used for. So, like last time, we've got a, uh, a rigid beam, and like I said, we're going to assume the beam is rigid, so it's not going to bend any. When it deflects, it's just going to stay straight. Okay, so rigid beam. It's being supported by a steel bar and a bronze bar. Now, these are deformable, so they can stretch. Okay, so if I take this, what, 12,000 pound load, and I put it on the tip of that beam, that beam is going to go something about like that, right? It's not going to deform. So this bar is going to stretch some, that bar is going to stretch some. Make sense? Alright, this is an example of an externally indeterminate structure. Because it's not like a composite column where you have one member and two materials inside that member. Now we have two separate members. Alright, now I've gone through and provided the areas, the modular elasticity, all that stuff. So now it's time to go through and do the grunt work. Okay, so far so good? that are going on with this structure. Now, what I mean by that is, 
For instance, we look at the support reaction, there's potentially an unknown force in the X direction, unknown force in the Y direction. Okay? But there's also two additional forces. Okay? There's a force in this rod and a force in this rod. Now, if I take this and I pull it down, what am I doing to those rods? Am I putting them in tension or compression? Tension. tension. So would a fair way of putting, putting that uh, be that I would take these uh, rods and yank on them about like this, so P steel and P, was that bronze? Something like that. Now do we know what those forces are? No, we don't know what they are. We haven't figured that out yet. But we know they're there, right? I mean, think about the rubber band. If I take a rubber band and stretch it, there's some force locked in that rubber band, right? So if I let it go, it goes boom, right? Same thing with this bar. If I take this bar and I stretch it, there's some force inside that bar because if I let it go, it's going to go back to the way it was, right? Make sense? All right. Now, my structural analysis, folks. Um, if I want to try and come up with an equation to represent these forces, I mean, I could sum forces in the y direction. I could sum y. You try sum forces in the x direction, that wouldn't really do me any good. But I really don't want to deal with these, these uh, reaction forces right here. So my structural analysis, folks, what do you think I ought to do? Sum moments at, at A. Okay. So let's sum moments at A. Move this. I don't know, my structural analysis folks are already getting tired of seeing this. Alright? So, we sum moments at A and say everything that's spinning this way has to equal everything that's spinning that way. So, if I'm looking at A, I've got a P steel acting at 3 feet, right? What else? I've got a P bronze at, well, no, from A, What's that? Yeah, so for at 8 feet. There we go. All right. And then we've got 12,000 pounds acting in the other direction at a moment arm of... There we go. Isn't it refreshing to do all of this with no IJK? Nothing against IJK, but only use it when you need it. All right, so 12,000 pounds times 12 feet is 144,000, what, foot-pounds? Equals P steel times 3 feet plus P bronze times 8 feet. I propose to you that this, that's equation one. We got that equation from equilibrium. Okay, we got that from equilibrium. All right. Sound good? Okay. All right. Now, compatibility.
Assume for the sake of discussion those are straight lines. Okay. Later on, we will spend a lot of time looking at beams and how they bend, but for now, we're not there yet. Okay. So, so far so good? Alright. So, let's take a look at dimensions. Let's go back and draw these dimensions again. Alright. So, So three feet, five feet, four feet. All right, so far so good? Okay. Now take this bar, or this beam, it goes down like this. So what happened to you know, this point. That point went from here to right there, right? Does that make sense? This point went from about here to about right there, right? So it deflected. I propose to you that this dimension right here is delta steel. This dimension is delta bronze. See what I mean? I mean, what, what are these deltas? They are amount of stretch or amount of deformation. Imagine this bar, okay? Like, let's look at the steel bar. You know, what does that steel bar look like? It's sort of, there's this and then that and then it sort of hangs down right here, right? So originally, it's yay long. Right? Afterwards, it's yay long. So that dimension is how much it stretches, right? That's delta steel. Same thing over here, this is delta bronze. Make sense? It's not too bad, right? So I propose to you that looking at the compatibility, I propose to you that delta steel is to three feet as delta bronze is to what? Eight feet. That's equation two. Make sense? Two equations, two unknowns. It's going to be alphabet soup and plug and joke from here on out. Make sense? All right, any questions? Okay, all right. Um, so from here on out, it's going to be alphabet soup. It's going to be plug and chug, so just bear with me. All right, you all need any of this? Can I go ahead and go on to the next panel? Two. <laughs> All right. So we have delta steel over three feet equals delta bronze over eight feet. So would you agree that that's P steel, L steel over three E steel, A steel equals P bronze. L bronze over eight E bronze A bronze. <coughs> and if you're wondering, wait a minute, it's not three and eight, it's three feet. Eight feet. Well, what happened to the feet units on each side? They're gonna cancel out, right? If I divide both sides by feet, they go away. Okay. Now Let's see if we can plug some values in to sort of simplify this out a little bit. All right, because maybe I'm getting a little tired of this whole alphabet suit thing. So, actually, here let, let's deal. Let's deal with the left first. Okay, we don't know what P steel is yet, right? We don't know what the force in the steel is. Do we know what the length of the steel is? And what is that? 
three feet, right? So maybe P steel times 36 inches. Is that a fair point? All right. Three times, we know the E for the steel, right? That's 30 times 10 to the 6 PSI. And then the area for the steel, what's the area for the steel? One square inch. All right. Now we don't know what the P for the bronze is either. Do we know the length of that bronze element? Yep. What is that? Eight foot. So what is 8 feet in inches? 96. Okay. We have 8 times E for the bronze. What's E for the bronze? Somebody else? And the area for the bronze. All right. So what I'm going to do is just because I, I, I don't like the alphabet super, I try and avoid it as much as I can. I'm going to take this and put all this over here. So, therefore, P steel equals P bronze. Times. Okay, on the top, you know, I'm flipping and multiplying, so I've got 3 times 30 times 10 6 psi times 1.0 inches squared. Yes? Can't you go ahead and cross out 36 inches in the 3 and the 96 inches in the 8 if you convert them both to inches? Well, yeah, I guess you could. I guess you could. But, um, I mean, we can if you want. I mean, we can. I just figured that make it easier to clean up a little bit. You're talking about, like, are you saying just, like, make this 12? Okay. Or, like, 36 and 3, like, just turning that into 12? Is that what you're saying? Since the 3 and well, 3 feet is 36. Inches. Okay, okay. So if you want, we can do that. It, 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 should, it shouldn't matter. Okay. Um, you want to? It doesn't matter. It's, you're going to see what happens here in a second, so, so just bear with me. All right. Um, Okay, so 96 inches. Just, just bear with me for one second. Okay, on the bottom, we're going to have 8 times 12 times 10 to the 6 PSI times 0 0.5 inch squared times 36 inches. All right, going to your point, I've got a couple larger points to make. Okay, number one, let's deal with units. What are the units of this fraction going to be? There is no units, okay? So, going to what you all were saying earlier, I mean, technically, if we wanted, we actually probably could have left that in feet and left that in feet because everything was going to cancel. I wanted to sort of get everything in a consistent unit system, move it all over to one side so that everybody could see what was going on, okay? Everybody okay with that? Now, so that probably kind of addresses what you all were saying a little bit more generally, okay? And you'll find that a lot with problems like this is, you know, if you're dealing with compatibility relationships, a lot of times you're taking E divided by E and A divided by A. So as long as you know, everything's consistent, you can arguably leave a lot of stuff the same. All right? And that happens every now and then in our field. Now, I want somebody to go through and just calculate this fraction and see what they get. Got five. Five. Anybody else get five? You got five? It came out to just five. So what I'm saying is this. P steel... equals 5 P bronze. So I'll say this. I'll say this is equation 2, like, revisited. Yeah. Matrix reloaded or something. <laughs> Told you. Cheesy, corny jokes. You should have to hit me, sir. Uh, 
What's that? I think that was a response to the movie itself. <laughs> oh, cinema critique. The mechanics of the form of a lot is tossed. All right. So, is everybody okay with this? So now I, I've gone through and I've plugged in all of the compatibility uh, uh, you know, terms associated with this equation and I've simplified it up a little bit. So, what I'm now going to do is I'm going to say, you know, uh, back to equation one. And what did equation one say? Equation one said three times P steel plus eight times P bronze is what, 144,000 foot pounds? Something like that? So, what do we have? Uh, let me see if I can simplify this up a little bit. So we have P steel times three feet, so maybe that's five P bronze times three feet plus you know, P bronze times eight feet is 144,000 foot pounds. And did I go too fast with that? Is everybody okay with that? You know, it was P steel times three and P bronze times eight. So instead of P steel, I put in P bronze or by P bronze. All right. Everybody okay with that? So. 5 times 3 is 15, plus 8 is 23, so P bronze times 23 feet is 144,000 foot-pounds, therefore P bronze is what? 143,977. Wait, no, I think mine is that. Oh, okay. I was like... <laughs> No, that's fine. 6261. Yes, 6261. Something like that? Yeah. All right. So 6261 what? Pounds. Pounds. This is a force, right? So it's pounds. And, and again, make sure that you're being consistent with the units. If I take foot pounds, foot times pounds, foot times pounds, divide by feet, the feet cancel and I get pounds. Okay. So there's the force in the bronze. Okay. Pretty straightforward, right? All right. Does everybody have this? Can I go on to the next panel? All right. So you can plug this into whatever equation you want. Um, personally, I think it's probably simpler to plug it back into equation two. So we have P bronze, uh, P steel is 5P bronze, which is 5 times what, that's 62, 61, which is what? 300 or 305, right? Yeah, 304.37. Good enough. All right. But those aren't the answers, right? What the problem asks for? The stresses. All right. So let's look at the stresses. So sigma bronze is P bronze over A bronze. And sigma steel is P steel over A steel. All right, so let's just put those over here. So what is the stress in the bronze and the stress in the steel? Steel is one, right? So this is thirty-one three zero five what? PSI. PSI, there we go. Units. And the bronze, we're gonna take the bronze and divide it by the area, which is 0.5. Essentially we're doubling that number. And what do we get? 
five, two, one, two, two, if, 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 you know, close, close enough. Answer. Now, what can somebody tell me about those stresses? Is there any engineering decisions that you can make about those stresses? Any engineering judgments that are worth assessing? The bronze looks like it's a good decision. The steel's kind of close, but you try to be okay with it. There we go. So going back to the yield, so let, let's write that down. So for bronze and steel, sigma y, sigma y are what? This is what, 35? All right. Now, okay, just looking at these numbers, just the raw numbers, are these members going to yield? No. No. Now, let's say I said that for this situation, the factor of safety is 2. Is it, is it good? No. No. Because for a factor of safety of 2, I have to limit my bronze stress to 10,000 PSI and limit this to 17,500, right? And both of those would violate that. So, technically, nominally, it's not going to yield. But depending upon your factor of safety, that might not be an adequate choice, okay? It's all about, you know, making those, you know, gut feeling engineering decisions, that engineering judgment. All right? Does that make sense? All right. So we didn't need this data to do the problem. It was all about discussion later. Okay? Sound good? All right. I want to at least introduce the next topic. Um, it's sort of our final topic with um, uh, axially loaded members. Okay? And that's the idea of thermal effects. Now, whether or not you all have had chemistry yet, or you're in there now, or even if you haven't had chemistry in college, or if you were even minorly or moderately exposed to it in high school, um, and even if you never even had the subject, I mean, go think about it. What have you? Had, what happens to a balloon when it gets cold? What happens to a balloon when it gets hot? Expands. When things get hot, they heat up. Or when they heat up. <laughs> My coffee hasn't kicked in. <laughs> when, he, when things heat up, they expand. When things cool down, they contract. Okay. Yeah. When, when things get hot, they heat up. That's a, that's a classic for me. No, um, <laughs> My coffee hasn't kicked in yet. No, but when, when things heat up, they expand. Now, from a deformal body standpoint, what that means is when something heats up or when something cools down, we generate a strain, right? We can generate a strain. Remember, change in length over ridge length. It deforms, and we can get that percent deformation. Now, now here's where thermal effects get a little wonky and get a little um, get a little tough. Okay, thermally, if I took this object here and I heated it up, it expands. So it generates a thermal strain. Right? Would an object like this generate a thermal stress? Think about it. Say it, say it loud. It depends on whether it's pushing on something else. Exactly. That is, that is a perfect way of putting it. If I just set a block of steel here on this table and heat it up, it's going to expand, but it's not going to generate any stress. Okay. Now, imagine I took that block of steel and I set it in a vice grip. And then I heat it up. Now, it's not straining, but we're getting some serious stresses because it's restrained. You see what I mean? So thermally, stresses and strains can be a little, little different. You've got to think about it. Okay? You've got to think about your situation. Um, sometimes, if, you, you know, if you've got a member that's completely unrestrained, all temperature variations are going to do is make your member longer or shorter, and that's it. Okay? But if there's some level of restraint, you can get some serious stresses. So I mean, some very significant ones. Um, I go back to the, the, the example of a highway bridge. If you have a highway bridge and you haven't properly detailed it for thermal expansion and contraction, you can get some serious problems uh, with, at, at, the, at the supports. I mean, because it might not seem like a lot, but you take a bridge and you put it through 100 degrees of temperature variation, I mean, it's amazing. I have one real quick story. I have a buddy of mine, 
and then we'll call it. I got a buddy of mine who is a project engineer for composing construction out in Charleston. And he did work on the Nitro St. Albans Bridge, that big, massive plate dirt bridge uh, between Nitro and St. Albans. When he first got the job, they put him as a project engineer on that site. And the way that they built the bridge was they built it from each end. And these girders, these steel beams, I mean, these are I beams that are like 12 foot deep. These are some serious, you know, steel sections. They were building from each end. They get to the centerpiece. They try and sit it down. It's too long. It's now the reason it's too long is because it's 100 degrees and the member thermally expanded. It was so hot that it got too long and they couldn't splice it together. So what do you think they did to cool it down? They dunked it in the river. They dunked it in the river. They let it sit down. It thermally contracted. They lifted up, bolted it right in place. That's engineering. I'm sorry. That that, that story. I just think it's amazing. All right. All right. So um, that's all I've got for you all today. Next time we will look at thermal expansion and contraction and make sure we've got our bookkeeping down pat when we uh, look at temperature data. That's all I got for you all today. See you next time. Okay. What was it you said?